Ammonia is produced in the harbour process. The raw materials for the harbour process are nitrogen and hydrogen, and the equation for the reaction is shown here. We can see the nitrogen, N2, diatomic gas, and hydrogen, H2, also a diatomic gas. They are the reactants. It's a reversible reaction, and we're producing the ammonia gas, which is the main point of the harbour process. We've been asked to give the sources of the nitrogen and the hydrogen used in the harbour process. Well, the nitrogen comes from the air. Around about 78% of the air that we breathe is made of nitrogen, and so that nitrogen is extracted from the air by a process called liquefaction. And so simply for the one mark here, we can just say air or the atmosphere. The hydrogen comes from natural gas. Natural gas forms in pockets, typically above where we get crude oil formation as well. So the, the major gas in natural gas is actually methane. So it's totally fine to say methane as an alternative of natural gas. There is, in fact, very, very small amounts of ethane and propane and butane as well mixed in together, which is why it's called natural gas or natural gases. The chemical reaction that you use to get the hydrogen out of the methane is a reaction with steam and therefore it is actually also okay to refer to the raw material used to get the hydrogen as water or steam as well because that is one of the two components in the chemical reaction that gets the hydrogen out of the methane gas. But the primary answer that I suggest you remember is that the hydrogen comes from natural gas. And then the question says, how does the equation for the reaction show that the atom economy for the forward reaction is 100%? Atom economy, usually expressed as a percentage, is a measure of how efficient a chemical reaction is. And this efficiency is based on the mass of the atoms that we've paid our money for at the beginning. So the nitrogen and the hydrogen in this case, and the conversion of those atoms into useful products, the ammonia. Now, because there is only one product, the ammonia, and that's the one that we're trying to make, there is 100% atom economy, as the question is telling us, because we only make one product. And a different way of flipping that is saying that there was no other product being formed at all. And if there's no other product being formed at all, then that means that there is no waste product being formed. And so we are being 100% efficient. All of the atoms that we've spent our money on are being converted into the desired product. And so there is only one product. That's all you need to say to get this one mark. Figure one represents the harbour process. And you can see that the nitrogen and the hydrogen raw materials are put into a reactor where there's an iron catalyst, by the way. And this is where the harbour process reaction occurs. And then because this reaction is reversible, that means we don't get 100% conversion into the ammonia. And so what comes out of the reactor is the ammonia, of course, but additionally, the unreacted nitrogen and hydrogen enters this container X. And then from this container X, the ammonia is removed, which is what we want. That's what we're going to use to make fertilizers, etc. But then the unreacted nitrogen and hydrogen get pumped back around into the reactor. It gets recycled. And this question here is asking us how that process occurs. Explain how the ammonia produced is separated from the unreacted nitrogen and hydrogen in X. The process occurring in X works because we've got three gases that have all got different boiling points. And when we cool these gases down, the one that has the highest boiling point is the one that is going to condense. And ammonia has the highest boiling point out of all three of these gases. And so when we drop the temperature down from around 450 degrees C that it was in the reactor, we keep lowering it and lowering it and lowering it. And once the boiling point of ammonia is reached, the temperature is not high enough to keep that ammonia as a gas anymore. And so the ammonia turns into a liquid. 
the hydrogen and the nitrogen, they have a boiling point much lower still. And so it is still hot enough to keep those two molecules as gases. And so they remain as gases. But the ammonia has been liquefied as a result of this cooling down. And what that allows us to do is to get liquid ammonia out of the bottom of container X and then the gases of nitrogen and hydrogen, they remain in X and then they can be pumped around still as gases back into the reactor where they will go again and react again to make more ammonia. So for two marks, we need to get one mark for saying that they cool it down. You could probably say that the temperature is decreased for this same marking point. And then the second mark is for saying that the ammonia liquefies or it condenses or it turns from a gas into a liquid. The harbour process uses a temperature of 450 degrees C and a pressure of 200 atmospheres. The table below shows how the percentage yield of ammonia produced at 450 degrees C changes when we use different pressures. And we've been commanded to complete figure two, which is this graph on the right hand side. The first two points have been plotted for us and we need to use a suitable scale on the X axis. So that is this X axis here where they've already labeled it as pressure for us and then plot the remaining data points and add a line of best fit. So our first job before we can plot any points is to work out what a suitable scale is. Now, ordinarily, if we're asked to do this, we might have to completely work this out for ourselves and we need to be guided by the fact that our scale needs to take up at least half of the graph paper that we've been given and our plotted points also need to take up half of the space that there is. Those are really important guiding principles. But here, because they've plotted the first two points for us, we can kind of work backwards to work out what the scale must be. So the percentage of ammonia being nine, that's this point that they've plotted here, and that's 60 atmospheres for this point like so. And that means that this point must be 60, and the next one along is 18, and the atmospheres is 120, so that means this is 120. And so what we can deduce here is that the, if this is 120, this point here must be 100. And so each minor grid line is 10 atmospheres. And so that means we've got 50, 100, 150, etc. as we work our way along to the right hand side. So that's one mark now for a suitable scale. And then it comes to just plotting the points on the graph. The next one that hasn't been plotted is 180 atmospheres. So here's 150, three small squares along makes us 180. And then we need to go up to 25. And so we're plotting it here. The next one is 240, so that's 250. So 240 is 10 less than that. And we need to work our way up to 30. Now we haven't explored this yet, but 30 and 31, each small line is 1%. So that's quite a nice scale really that they've given us for this graph. So 31 is going to be here. And then 300, well, that actually is on a major grid line. So that's going to be here and we're going up to 36. So this is 35. And so here will be 36, 360. Well, that's 350, 360 is here and we need to go up to 40. So that again is on a major grid line. And then 420 is the last one. And so we need to look for 400 and 410, 420 is here. And we're going up to 40, 41, 42, 43. And so that is our final point. There are two marks for plotting these points. And how this normally works is if you've got five points that we need to plot, like we have here, you'll get one mark for plotting three or four of those points correctly and you'll get the second mark if you've actually plotted all five of them correctly. How much tolerance will they allow? Well, you can normally get within half a small square of where it should be. And so that means that if you were plotting a point at 31 and you plotted it at 31.5, you would probably get the benefit of the doubt in that case. But if you were plotting 31 and you plotted 32, you would lose that mark. So as a rule of thumb, plus or minus half a small square is what we're working towards for either of those axes. And so because that is the case, it's important to make sure your points are nice and clear. Don't draw with a quite a chunky pencil so that it's not really very obvious where the line is. 
And so for instance, this cross here is probably too big. And so that's why I've gone for quite small crosses early on. So it's very obvious which area of the graph paper I'm actually targeting with my cross. Crosses are definitely better than dots because it's easier to aim them and it's also easier to see them once we draw our best fit line that we're about to draw in a minute. It's very easy for dots to get hidden by a best fit line and so you could end up losing the marks for plotting the points if your best fit line covers up those dots that you are using to indicate the points. Sometimes it's really important to plot the zero, zero mark here, but we haven't been given it, so you should ignore that on this occasion. But just be on the lookout if at the top of the graph they were saying zero atmospheres was zero percent yield. We've not been told to plot that point, so there wouldn't be a mark for it, so let's not worry about it. And then it comes on to the best fit line. When you draw a best fit line, it's again really important that you would have a sharp pencil to draw this so that the best fit line does not cover up the points that you have plotted. And again, there is a plus or minus half a small square for where your best fit line should be. So again, you haven't got much of a margin for error, so don't use a blunt pencil to do this. It's also really important that your best fit line is a single line and you don't lift the pencil off the paper whilst you're doing your best fit line. That's a really crucial idea because if you do lift your pencil off the paper, the line could end up looking feathered, which means it's kind of a, a zigzag line. We absolutely in chemistry never do point-to-point -point best fit lines and as I've already said we don't want those lines to be thick. So this needs to be a curve and you can sort of tell it's a curve if you get your head down towards the paper never pick up your test paper in a test because it might look like you're showing somebody your answers but if you get your head down near the paper you can see it starts to curve pretty early on. It's definitely not a straight line and I can show that with a straight line like this, you can absolutely see that the straight line obviously continues in a linear direction, but these last few points bend away. Now, clearly I wouldn't recommend drawing a straight line just to find out whether it's a straight line, but you can pick up your ruler and kind of turn it onto its side and look down at your paper, and you can see that you end up with some points curving away from the best fit line. So a straight line is not appropriate. It needs to, on this occasion, be a smooth curve like I'm drawing here. And there would be, as I've already said, a little bit of a margin for error, but we need to draw a smooth line that is not feathered and is not too thick. And then we're told to determine the percentage yield of ammonia at 450 degrees C and 500 atmospheres and show your working on figure two, which is the graph that we've just drawn. And so the significance of it being 450 degrees C is basically giving us permission to use the graph that we've just drawn because that was the temperature for all of this data. But 500 atmospheres is a pressure that was not measured, so we don't actually know what the percentage yield is, but we're using our graph to work out what it probably is. And so when they've said show your working on figure two, that means that there is a mark here for indicating on our graph how we are getting towards our answer. And the way that we would do this is by a process referred to as extrapolation. Extrapolation is where we look at a set of data, for instance, the data that we've got here, and we look at the pattern that it is showing. And then when we get to the end of the data that we've collected, we assume that this pattern will continue in the sort of direction that it was going. And so that's the process of extrapolation, to continue a pattern and assume that it does continue in the same way. And so there'll be one mark in this question for literally drawing a continuation of that line. Now that could be in the exact same way that we did before, or it could be a dotted line or a dashed line. Either of those is absolutely fine. But what is really important is that we continue our line to at least 500 atmospheres. If you go beyond, that's absolutely fine, but it must go to at least 500 atmospheres as I'm showing here. And then having done that, what we're doing is we're looking at our 500 atmosphere line and we're looking at the percentage that we reach. So my line went to about 46%, perhaps just a tiny bit under, but we'll get a mark here for reading across to our y-axis to wherever our extract 
extrapolated line gets to. So mine got to 46%, and so to correctly read it, I would have to write 46% as the percentage yield at 500 atmospheres. Now, if you extrapolated your line badly and you got a different number, you would get some credit for correctly reading off your poorly extrapolated line. And depending on how you plotted your points earlier, this will also affect your best fit line, which will affect your extrapolation, which will affect your percentage. So as a result of this, there's probably going to be a range of acceptable answers, perhaps between 45 and 47, or maybe even beyond, depending on the quality of the line that you drew earlier.